Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21st online Spintronic seminar. Thank you for joining us. This is uh, Xing Fan from University of Denver. Um, it's an it's a, it's a, a, a unconventional time for our online Spintronic seminar. I hope you have uh, enjoyed your dinner or I enjoy your dinner right now. <laughs> so today's, today's talk will be the fourth IEEE Distinct Lecture we host online and the, the last this year. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Masashi Shirai. She received his PhD degrees from Kyoto University in 2003. He was a researcher in Sony Corporation Research Center before joining Osaka University as an associate professor in 2004 and then full professor in 2010. Since 2013, he has been a professor at the Department of Electronic Science and Engineering, Kyoto University. He was a guest scientist at uh, Max Planck Institute, a guest professor of University of Regensburg, and a researcher of JST Presto program between 2007 and uh, 2011. Professor Shreishi has over 150 peer-reviewed publications and uh, received many awards, including the Outstanding Research Award from the Magnetic Society of Japan and uh, the Commendation for Science and Technology by the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. So without further ado, Professor Shreishi, please go ahead with our talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh... So first, I thank all of you to join my talk uh, in an unconventional time. And I'm really looking forward to giving the talk, uh, giving my first experience uh, to give an online talk. And of course, I thank, uh, greatly thank uh, Shin and Kirill for organizing this uh, great seminar in an online form. So today's uh, topic is uh, spins in low dimensional material systems. And especially I focus on transport, gate modulation and conversion of them. So before starting uh, uh, my talk, so please allow, allow me to uh, give a short introduction of the act activities of IEEE because this is uh, part of my distinguished, distinguished lecture talk. And uh, IEEE strongly requested me to show this slide before starting the talk. So unfortunately, because as, uh, unfortunately, as you know, so because of the COVID-19 issues, uh, many uh, conferences uh, such as Interma, MMM, uh, canceled or uh, held in only in an online form. But uh, actually, I, I3 uh, is organizing many important, uh, significant conferences. And also, uh, I3 organizes uh, free summer school for graduate students. So this year, unfortunately, this was canceled, but uh, hopefully uh, from next year, many people can join and enjoy the summer school. And the uh, Distinguished Lecturer program is, uh, of course, an uh, important part of the, the activities, and I'm belonging to this program. And uh, it's really uh, publish some important papers, and please submit uh, your latest and interesting cutting-edge uh, uh, achievements uh, to these journals. Okay, so I can be more relaxed, and I start from the introductory part. So I think most of the audience are working in the field of spintronics, and I can, I can, how to say, I can be more brave to cut some parts, but uh, I emphasize that uh, spintronics uh, is a field of controlling uh, spin degrees of freedom in solids, mainly in solids, some parts, sometimes in liquids, but mainly in solids. And as you know, in the first generation of uh, spintronics, uh, people you mainly used uh, metallic materials and uh, they discovered uh, very significant uh, effects uh, such as GMR and TML, uh, which opened uh, this uh, new field, spintronics. In the second generation, uh, semiconductor mater semiconducting materials uh, became the uh, important part of the materials uh, in spintronics and uh, dilated, uh, dilated magnetic semiconductors and the realization of spin transport in inorganic semiconductors. These things are main research topics uh, in the second generation of spintronics. So now we, I can say, uh, we are now in the third generation, the age of spin current electronics and spin optronics. 
And uh, as you know, spintronics uh, possesses uh, many fruitful fundamental physics and also uh, plenty of possibilities of applications. And uh, I'm a person of fundamental physics. Uh, I'm much interested in uh, uh, propagation of spin current and also topology in solids because uh, uh, we can realize, uh, we can expect such kinds of uh, uh, spin momentum locking on the surface of topological insulators. And also I'm interested in spin car electronics, uh, which is a fusion of car electronics and spin, spin electronics. But of course I should emphasize that the spin electronics has many uh, possibilities of uh, practical applications. So in this sense, uh, uh, spin electronics uh, is regarded as uh, one of the pivotal technologies as beyond seamless electronics. So in, spin, current, um, in modern spin electronics, uh, transport, control, and conversion of spins. These are more, uh, very, very important. So to realize spin transport, uh, people often use this uh, uh, electrical method or dynamical method. And of course, sometimes uh, optical method and also uh, spin car electronics method. Some, uh, some, gra uh, some uh, gradation uh, is used. So to control, uh, of, to control spins uh, propagating in solids, so there are many uh, pot uh, potential ways. So most, the most orthodox one is uh, solid gating, as in the seamless uh, devices. But of course, ma external magnetic field allows the control of spins. So more recently, these two are becoming rising star to control spins. One is ionic gating, so which allows uh, uh, efficient application of strong electric, uh, strong electric field to the solids as uh, a surface of the solids, and uh, uh, due to the uh, loss, uh, due to the efficient charge accumulation. The other is a soil proximity. So I explain it later, more in more detail. But uh, we can transfer the spin orbit interaction to the uh, light uh, elements, uh, which has a very small spin orbit interaction. So because as you know, the spin is not an, is a non-conservative uh, physical quantity, we need to convert it to the other physical quantity to detect it. So for this purpose, people often use a potentiometric method. This, this means the conversion of spins to the electric current or uh, uh, electromotive forces, and also inverse spin hole effect which uh, is uh, attributed to the spin orbit interaction in solids, uh, we often use this effect. So when we look back at the uh, chronicle of ma materials quest in spintronics, so this is a rough uh, sketch of the quest, uh, of the chronicle. So in the first uh, generation, people often use this, uh, people often use the light, uh, metals uh, such as cobalt, uh, copper, aluminum, silver, and so on. So uh, in the third generation, uh, along the spin orbit, spin orbitronics directions, so heavy metals such as platinum, tungsten, bismuth, these uh, materials are attracting uh, great attention. So along the spin current-tronic direction, so in the second generation, uh, group four uh, inorganic semiconductors such as silicon germanium, uh, in addition to C5 compound uh, semiconductors such as uh, gallium arsenide, are uh, often used. And more recently, in the 21st century, as you know, graphene and TMDs, such kinds of atomically flat materials, are uh, attracting great attention in the field. And uh, of course, the topological initiator uh, is one of the most significant ones. And uh, oxide two-dimensional electron gas systems. This is also, and if I'm allowed to be more brave, so ultrasymmetric materials. This is also uh, this is also becoming an inter uh, interesting and important material stage for modern spintronics. So you can recognize that these materials are low-dimensional materials, and th this is uh, this is the reason why I give a talk today. So I, here in my talk, uh, I try to emphasize the importance of the, such kinds of novel exotic material systems in modern spintronics. Of course, uh, along the spin orbitronics direction, TMDs and topological initiators, uh, which have a, a sizable spin orbit interaction, 
uh, they are uh, very important uh, in modern spin -tronics. So in the third generation of spintronics, so we have been using the bulky mat materials, uh, bulk metals and bulk semiconductors, but uh, uh, more recently, uh, people are shifting to the uh, more exotic way, uh, namely uh, uh, the utilization of uh, uh, low dimensional materials, material systems. This is a recent trend of modern spin current and spin orbitronics. Okay, so let's have a closer look about the details of their uh, possible materials uh, in uh, modern uh, spin -tronics. So the first uh, example is atomically flat materials. This is originally two-dimensional materials. Of course, the graphene is the most important, is the most significant in 21st century uh, in uh, condensed matter physics. And as you know, uh, the group of Groningen uh, uh, achieved the first room temperature spin transport in single layer graphene. And after that, uh, there are uh, millions of papers related about the spin transport, charge transport, or some interesting physics topics. And, uh, but uh, at this time, people did not expect that the spin conversion can be realized uh, in graphene because graphene consists of uh, only carbon atoms. Uh, and the carbon atom is a very light element. Of course, uh, the atomic number of carbon is just six. So because of this, uh, we cannot expect the size of a spin orbit inter interaction in, spin, uh, in graphene. But uh, in 2016, uh, my group uh, realized the uh, unbipolar spin conversion in single graphene. So the second important uh, material uh, in this uh, category is uh, TMDs, transition metal dichalcogenase. The pioneering work uh, was carried out Kim Paimak and co-workers, and uh, they uh, realized the uh, emission of the circularly polarized light uh, from the single layer MOS2. So soon after that, a group of university of Tokyo uh, reported the reciprocal effect. They illuminated the circularly polarized light to the single layer MOS2, and they observed the very whole effect. So in this sense, the TMD is a very good stage to investigate the varietronics. So my group was hesitating to join this interesting field, uh, but uh, we slowly joined uh, this field. And this is the first uh, paper from my group related with the uh, TMDs in the field of spintronics. And in that paper, uh, my coworker, Dr. Gupta, uh, realized the uh, formation of very uh, short, very small Schottky barrier height between uh, ferromagnetic mirror electrode and uh, single AI MOS2. So the, the other important, the third important uh, material stage is a Pondervas heterostructure, artificial heterostructure system. So in this system, uh, the, we can uh, realize the fusion of TMD and graphene. And uh, here I show some only a limited number of uh, important uh, results. And uh, in uh, all of them, let's say, uh, combine the TMD and graphene uh, shown here. And because of the uh, formation of such kinds of Fandelbaugh's heterostructure, proximity in this uh, spin orbit interaction is uh, generated in, even in graphene. So this uh, SOI comes from the TMD. And because of this, the uh, in-frame spin lifetime is much shorter than uh, that uh, along the, uh, uh, that uh, in-frame spin lifetime is much shorter than perpendicular spin lifetime because of the uh, artificial SOI in graphene. So in this sense, uh, this uh, found the first feather structure is, uh, can be uh, uh, the other uh, good material stage for spin current turnings and spin orbitals. So the second important uh, low dimensional system is a rush bar splitting system in hetero interfaces. So the pioneering work was carried out Christian Nasser's co-workers and they reported this uh, great uh, large uh, rush bar splitting uh, appearing in the Bismuth Silo uh, interface. And because of uh, this uh, large rush bar splitting, uh, we can expect uh, effi efficient spin conversion in the system as pro theoretically predict predicted by Edelstein in this small paper. And group of France uh, actually uh, realized the first uh, spin conversion by using this Rashivar 
either shine uh, spreading. And this is uh, their uh, device structure. They fabricated such kind of uh, uh, multi-layer system. So bismuth is here, silver is here, and palm oil, which is a spin source, is uh, sitting here. And spin current is injected from palm oil to silver bismuth system, and spin current reaches to the uh, silver bismuth interface. And uh, because of the large rush bar spreading, spin dependent spreading, uh, the injected spin current is converted to the charge current, of which direction is uh, uniquely determined. And uh, this is uh, uh, experimental uh, of uh, a demonstration of the observation of the rush bar Edelstein, inverse rush bar Edelstein. And my group uh, carried out a similar work uh, by changing stacking order uh, in order to uh, estimate, uh, quantitatively estimate the uh, uh, rush bar Edelstein length, uh, which the, is the uh, index of the spin conversion efficiency uh, in this system. And of course, as topological initiator, it's uh, an important large bus processing system. So this is uh, this cartoon shows uh, uh, what the uh, topological initiator is. As you see, so the surface is metallic, and this is true to uh, to this system. And the bulk of the topological initiator is initiated, and this is a band structure. So the bulk uh, band is a uh, as uh, is a typical conventional semiconductor semiconductor like band structure but uh, this these two uh direct like linear bands uh they come from the surface state and more importantly uh, each band is uh spin polarized and because of this uh spin polarization uh spin and momentum is uh are completely locked and uh due to this uh we can express such kind of very unique uh, spin momentum locking uh band structure so because the topological initiator is consisting of heavy metals, heavy materials, and uh, of which uh, charm number is non-zero, uh, meanwhile, the uh, vacuum uh, is a usual, of course, vacuum is a very usual, and, and uh, vacuum and the charm number is zero. And because of the discontinuity of the charm numbers between vacuum and topological initiator, uh, this, uh, such kinds of interesting bond inversion takes place. This is a very important message uh, in this part. The third important system is two days. So I show one uh, great example carried out by Albert Hurt and co-workers, and they use a uh, lanthanum aluminate, strontium titanate, uh, heterostructures. So because of the uh, strong rush bar field in between LVO and steel, uh, very efficient spin conversion can be expected. And in fact, they observe the efficient and gated two level uh, spin conversion by using this system at seven Kelvin. The point is uh, the extremely large uh, dielectric constant of uh, strontium, strontium titanate. So of course, uh, this is a very uh, interesting, uh, important work. And, uh, but um, my group uh, were also interested uh, in this material from the other point of view. So we recognize that at room temperature, uh, the dielectric constant of the STO uh, goes down rapidly, and this allows a weak rush bar field at the interface, even though the two-dimensional electron gas is still alive, uh, is uh, still existing at the interface. So we injected spin current from palm alloy by the spin pumping method, and uh, spin current is generated uh, in the two-dimensional electron gas system, and uh, the, the spins are propagated uh, in these two decks and lead to the uh, heavy metal electrode and convert it to the charge current by the uh, inverse spin holder. This is our, uh, our experimental strategy. And actually, we observed this uh, sizable uh, electromotive forces. And uh, we estimated, uh, this is the first uh, demonstration, the demonstration of the room temperature spin transport in uh, oxide two decks and the spin diffusion length was estimated to be about 300 nanometers. And this uh, works uh, opened a new field of uh, uh, oxide spin trends. And of course, uh, we are not allowed to forget about this very traditional important 2D systems, carrying malacinite based. And a group of Regens work uh, uh, intensively uh, studied this uh, material systems. 
and they uh, reported extremely large magnet resistance, uh, which is attributed to the uh, resonant toning. And also in a group of Japan, uh, reported the persist, uh, generation of persistent spin helix state uh, generated in this uh, two deck systems by controlling the Rushver and Dressel Hall's type uh, spin orbit uh, coupling, spin coupling cons, or spin orbit coupling constants. So the latest, uh, the newest uh, material stage is uh, metallic uh, ultra thin metals. So this uh, here I show one example, two nanometer thick platinum. So later on, uh, I explain the detail, but uh, uh, here I briefly show the uh, importance of this material. And uh, as you see, the, by tuning the gate voltages, we can control resistance and also inverse pinhole voltage. So in the last part of my talk, I give I explain it uh, in more detail. Okay. So, because our, most of the, the audience are familiar with experimental methods, so I skipped the uh, uh, experimental methods. But uh, uh, in my all, most of uh, in most of my studies, I use the uh, uh, electrical electrical potentiometric method and spin pumping methods. And uh, today, I give two selected topics. One is uh, spin detection in topological insulator. The other is uh, uh, spin pumping into uh, ultra thin metallic materials where two novel spin orbit interaction can be realized. Okay, the first example is a topological insulator. And uh, as you know, so topological insulator is a new class of materials in 21st century, and the spin momentum rocking attracts many people in spintronics uh, like me. And the first important uh, milestone is the detection of the surface spin polarization expected uh, like this. So as you see, it's a uh, the up spin goes to the left, the down spin goes to the right. So this is completely the pure spin current form, and uh, to detect uh, such kinds of spin polarization, this is the first. This was the first milestone. So to de to detect the uh, surface spin polarization, we uh, uh, we prepared such kinds of setup. So the middle wire is a ferromagnetic, and uh, these two are non-magnetic uh, wires, and uh, we injected electric current by using this third. And uh, uh, the magnetization of uh, this ferromagnetic electrodes is controlled by the external magnetic field. And of course, this is a wire and uh, such kinds of uh, uh, coercive pulse uh, can be uh, realized uh, by using such kinds of null wire. And uh, as you know, so when we fix the uh, direction of uh, momentum, K vector direction, so spin direction is automatically determined. This is what the uh, spin momentum locking means. So in, in this uh, cartoon, so the electron goes to the light and the spin direction is in plane, but uh, go along uh, this direction. And uh, when, uh, by controlling the magnetization direction of this ferromagnetic electrodes, we can detect the direction of spins propagating electrons uh, by the potentiometric way. So of course, when we reverse the uh, momentum direction, so the spin direction is automatically reversed. So this means uh, uh, we can expect such kinds of magnet resistance as a function of the external magnetic field by using such kinds of device by, and by controlling the current injection direction. So this is the uh, strategy. So uh, we fabricated such kinds of device so we use uh, uh, BSTS, uh, the three-dimensional bulk insulator, topological insulator, which was provided by the group of uh, Professor Yoichi Ando of the University of Kerala. And uh, we exfoliated this uh, material and we transfer transferred uh, the flake to the uh, SIO to substrate and uh, equip, uh, we equip it, uh, these kinds of thermal electrodes and also non-magnetic gold electrodes. So here I show the temperature dependence of the uh, resi uh, resistivity of uh, BSTS and also bismuth serenite as a control. Uh, this is a control uh, sample. As you may know, so BSTS is a, a bulk insulator topological insulator, which means a Fermi level is located in between con uh, bulk conduction band and balance band. And uh, only uh, surface Dirac band 
is uh, touching with uh, Fermi uh, Meanwhile, uh, bismuth selenide is not a bulk initiative uh, topological initiator, which means uh, Fermi level is located in the uh, bulk conduction mode, like in the degenerate uh, inorganic semiconductors. So because of this, we can expect, we can expect the detection of spin uh, polarization only on bismuth uh, BSTS. And uh, as I show here, so B, uh, the temperature dependence of the resistivity of BSTS is uh, is what's uh, is a typical uh, topological initiator one, uh, but uh, B, uh, the, that of bismuth selenide is a usual metallic one. So from this fact, uh, we can expect, uh, uh, we can say, we can conclude that the bismuth BSTS in this work is a, really is a uh, bulk, insulated, bulk insulated topological insulator. So by using the BSTS device, we try to measure the, uh, to detect the magnet resistance effect. At first, we try the measurement at low temperature, 4.2 Kelvin. And when we injected the electric current of plus 100 microampere, such kinds of magnet resistance effects was observed. So the important is the sign reversal of this magnet resistance effect by changing the uh, uh, polarity of the electric current. And in fact, as uh, when we uh, change the polarity of the uh, injection electric current, uh, the polarity of the magnet resistance was also reversed. So this is a very uh, important uh, evidence uh, of uh, uh, the successful detection of surface spin polarization of BS6. So here uh, you see there's some a small do drop of the magnetic resistance. So this is attributed to the uh, detection of AML, uh, unisotropic magnet resistance, which appears in the uh, ferro ferromagnetic paramolary narrow wire. So next uh, we change the temperature uh, to 300 Kelvin. Unfortunately, uh, we did not see the magnet resistance, but just we detect the AMR of it. But uh, this, uh, the detection of AMR is also the, uh, the other proof of the, uh, the other proof that uh, our experimental setup uh, works uh, as designed. So this is the temperature dependence of the uh, magnet resistance uh, effect. And uh, at that time, so magnet resistance effect uh, goes down as a function of temperature. And uh, this, uh, the magnet resistance disappeared around 150 Kelvin or something like this. So next I show the control sample, uh, control sample this serenade. So even though we uh, cool down the sample uh, to 4.2 Kelvin, only AML effect was observed. And of course, uh, nothing appeared at uh, uh, room temperature. So this is physically natural because the bismuth serenide is not uh, the bulk initiative, and uh, Fermi level is does not uh, does not touch with the uh, does not merely touch uh, the uh, surface direct band. So this is a re uh, reason why we did not observe the magnet resistance effect uh, due to the uh, topology of the uh, topological injury. But of course, uh, the next challenge uh, is the uh, uh, detection of the topological uh, signals at room temperature. And for this purpose, uh, my uh, great uh, collaborator, Associate Professor Ando, uh, visited uh, Dr. Felix Casanova's group in San Sebastian and uh, carried us a uh, 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 joint research of this topic. So to realize, to uh, detect the surface spin polarization at room temperature, uh, we fabricate such kinds of device. The first one is a conventional copper spin bulbs, nothing interesting. And uh, as you see, it's a very nice uh, non-local uh, spin uh, signals uh, was detected from this device. So uh, next we insert, inserted the uh, topological initiator in between two palmar electrodes. And copper wire is uh, equipped on the topological initiator. As expected, uh, because of the surface spin polarization, the propagating spins are partly absorbed to the topological initiator. And because of this, uh, the, uh, the magnitude, the magnitude of the 
uh, magnet resistance effect uh, goes down. So this is the direct evidence of the, uh, the evidence that the topological insulator is located uh, beneath the copper wire. So because the uh, spins are uh, adsorbed into topological insulator, we can expect the detection of the spin conversion signal. Because uh, for instance, as uh, shown in this cartoon, so when uh, spin is along this direction, they uh, adsorb the spins, uh, adsorb the spins into a topological insulator is converted to the charge current. And this uh, uh, gives rise to the uh, electromotive force. So this is the first data uh, and the measurement was carried at, at uh, low temperature. And uh, even though we uh, repeated uh, the experiments many times, nothing was observed. The uh, nuisance is a large uh, noise uh, which comes from the device, mainly from the uh, gold topological initiator interface. So to circumvent uh, this problem, so we slightly modify the device structure. As you see, the copper wire completely covers the uh, topological initiator. So by using this device, uh, device structure, uh, the uh, in, uh, contact resistance between topological insulator and gold uh, much uh, largely decreases. And also by covering the copper, uh, uh, by cover, uh, covering the topological insulator by the copper wire, so spin conversion takes place in every, in many places in, topo uh, in topological insulators even though the uh, generated uh, electric current uh, came, uh, comes back to the uh, copper wire. But uh, uh, in total, uh, we can suppress the noise level and also we can uh, increase the total layer, which allows us uh, spin conversion. So by, by, by this modification, we can see such kinds of nice spin conversion signals. This is a spin to charge, namely the uh, spins are adsorbed into the topological insulator and converted to the electromotive force. And of course, uh, there is a reciprocal effect. Ah, oh, sorry, this is the uh, so-called uh, inverse spin hole effect, uh, like, like inverse, uh, sorry, inverse rush by Einstein effect. And of course, there is a reciprocal effect, uh, rush by Einstein effect. And uh, to uh, achieve this, we uh, inject electric current and uh, we uh, observe the spin signal by using this circuit. And uh, as expected, uh, the su such kinds of charge to spin signal we observed. So important here is that the polarity is, uh, uh, polarity is uh, opposite. This is, uh, uh, this is due to, this comes from the reciprocity. So the second important is uh, the magnitudes of, of both signals are the same. This also due to the reciprocity. So this is what I would like to emphasize in this chart. So next interesting is uh, until which temperature this, uh, spin, uh, this sig uh, spin to charge and charge to spin signals can uh, light. So as you see, so even at, even at room temperature, we can see the reciprocal uh, spin conversion signal. We can detect the reciprocal spin conversion signals. So then uh, we can conclude that the reciprocal spin conversion can be realized at room temperature. And this means uh, uh, spin, uh, surface spin polarization can be detected at room, tem at room temperature. Okay, so I move on to the ne uh, next topic, so uh, tuning of the spin orbit interaction in ultra thin platinum by using ionic gating. So before starting this topic, please allow me to give you a very simple quiz. Please consider uh, the situation that uh, you add the glass of water into C and empty cup. The question is, uh, can you recognize that uh, water amount increases or not? So the answer is simple in the case of empty cup. Of course, uh, you can recognize the uh, total amount of uh, water uh, increased. But uh, in the case of C, the situation is not so easy, very complicated. Or maybe the total amount of uh, water will uh, increase, but uh, we cannot recognize it. So actually, this is a very tricky uh, quiz. And uh, if your answer is uh, yes, we can recognize uh, you are called to be full. And uh, if your answer is uh, no, the, uh, the total amount of water does not increase, so then yeah, your answer is incorrect. So in, anyway, so you're partially treated. This is a tricky quiz. But 
Uh, the same thing, completely same thing holds uh, the operation principle uh, seems transistors, uh, purity of transistors. So now everyone understand, uh, understands uh, why, uh, understands uh, we can fabricate uh, purity of transistors if it is by using metric materials. So and we have to use uh, inorganic semiconductors. The reason is uh, this. So metallic materials uh, possesses a sufficient amount of uh, charges. And even when we apply very strong gate voltage, which allows a very uh, large density of charge accumulation, so that uh, conductivity does not change uh, greatly. So in ionic semiconductors, the intrinsic carrier density is very small. And by applying very large uh, gate voltages, so the total number of charges can be greatly modulated, and this allows the uh, modulation of conductivity. This is a basic operation principle of the field of fixed transistors. So, but uh, my curiosity was towards what happens if we fabricate, we can fabricate a very thin metallic material uh, in, which, uh, uh, in which only a limited number of carrier is. And also, what happens uh, by applying very strong uh, gate voltage, namely, namely very effective gating, which allows the dense uh, carrier accumulation to the system. So by combining this, what happened? So this was my curiosity. So actually, uh, such kinds of ultra thin uh, film uh, is becoming an important material stage and the, I show one example carried out by a Professor Teru Ono's group. And uh, they fabricated uh, such kinds of ultra thin cobalt layer and uh, hafnium dioxide is equipped onto the uh, cobalt layer. And surprisingly, the curie temperature of this thin cobalt uh, goes down rapidly as a function of uh, thickness. And more surprisingly, by applying gate voltages, uh, that the curie temperature of this one nanometer cobalt was largely moderated. So th this means that ultra thin uh, uh, fusion of a gate voltage and uh, ultra thin film allows the uh, uh, changing of magnetic properties. So as soon after that, the same group reported the more drastic uh, control of magnetization as a function of gate voltage and by using ionic rigid film. So uh, the, my uh, interest is uh, what happened. Uh, I expect it's a uh, uh, modulation of resistivity and hopefully spin orbit interaction if we use uh, heavy metals uh, by, uh, uh, by combining non magnetic uh, heavy metals and ionic gain. And this is a, a card, this card shows the device structure which we used. So we use a, a E substrate as a spin source ferromagnetic because it is a ferromagnetic insulator. And uh, we evaporated the ultra thin platinum film uh, on the E. And uh, ionic rigid is equipped on the uh, ultra thin platinum film. And uh, gate voltage is applied via the uh, ionic rigid. So the, this, is, uh, this is the name of the ionic gel which we used. And uh, the name is uh, uh, cryptographically complicated, so I skip it. But uh, uh, such kinds of ionic gels allows us to apply the very uh, uh, strong electric field to the adjacent uh, source because the uh, uh, electric double layer is formed uh, on the surface of source. And uh, uh, the thickness of the effective double layer is one nanometer. Uh, which allows a very, uh, this means uh, the capacitance of the electric uh, double layer is quite, uh, is extremely large. And this large uh, uh, capacitance allows us uh, uh, applying to uh, strong electric field to the system. So uh, here I show the, uh, first I show the thickness dependence of the resistivity of the ultra thin platinum. And as you see, uh, when the thickness goes down, so the resistivity goes up. And such kinds of thickness dependence is uh, reproduced by the theoretical fitting function uh, presented in this uh, paper. 
And we extract we can extract some important physical parameters related with uh, uh, charge transport uh, in the ultrasim film systems. And from this uh, physical parameters, we can uh, estimate it. We can estimate the carrier density of the two nanometer thick uh, platinum to be six times ten to the twenty first per cubic centimeter. So a lot of low. So I should say. So next, I show the uh, gate voltage dependence of the resistance. So as you see, when we apply the positive gate voltage, so the resistivity goes down uh, approximately half of the maximum. And from this uh, gate voltage dependence of the resistivity, uh, we can estimate the accumulated uh, carrier density to be 10 to the 14th. Of course, this is very high, but uh, when we use the uh, ionic rigids, so such kinds of uh, large uh, carrier density can be routinely achieved. So this slide is a central result of this uh, work. And uh, this here, I show the gate voltage dependence of the electromotive forces uh, from the ultrasim platinum. Of course, this uh, experiment is carry, was carried out uh, by this uh, under the spin pumping uh, situation. So as you see, uh, at zero gate voltage, uh, we can see the sizable uh, electromotive force from the two nanometer thick plat uh, Sorry, uh, uh, from now on, uh, we focus only on the two nanometer thick platinum. Sorry. And uh, at zero gate voltage, uh, in the minus 1.4 uh, voltage, uh, we see the sizable uh, electromotive forces. But uh, when we, are, we are applied uh, positive gate voltages, uh, the electromotive forces go down and finally almost missing. So this was a very surprising result to us. So to understand the physics behind, uh, so we, uh, we consider the mechanism as follows. So first, uh, so I emphasize that the uh, electric current uh, generated by the inverse spin fold effect is described as uh, uh, this, this uh, such kinds of function as a product of spin hole conductivity, spin current density, and tangent hyperbolic. Because our uh, platinum is very thin and uh, very resistive, so the spin, uh, from this uh, uh, investigation by the uh, Spanish group, so the spin diffusion length is quite short. And because of this, uh, this tangent hyperbolic term uh, is, uh, can be regarded as unity. So next we plot it's the gate voltage dependence of the normalized uh, electric current. So because the uh, inverse spin hole effect is uh, the effect of generating electric, electric current, not uh, generating voltage. This is the important point. Because the uh, electric, electric current is generated by the scattering of spin uh, current. And if the normalized uh, electric current does not uh, exhibit the uh, uh, gate voltage dependence, so this means the uh, uh, spin hole conductivity is constant. But in fact, uh, the normalized electric current uh, exhibits a large, uh, very significant uh, uh, gate voltage dependence. So this means the spin hole conductivity is modulated by the, by the gating. So of course, uh, the previous work by uh, Felix Casanova and co-workers reported the uh, conductivity as the relationship between conductivity and spin hole conductivity. And in that report, uh, they uh, observed, uh, they uh, claimed that the spin hole conductivity is almost constant uh, within this scheme. However, we uh, consider, we, we we, if we remember the universal relationship between uh, sigma xx and uh, sigma xy, uh, here sigma xy is, a, is regarded as a anomalous, uh, con anomalous uh, hole conductivity or spin hole conductivity. So they are experimented, uh, they are at the one border of intrinsic regime. So however, in our case, because uh, our platinum is very resistive, so we are at the other border of the intrinsic regime. And in this border, uh, the spin hole conductivity is largely dependent on the uh, sigma xx, uh, conventional conductivity. So because we are in the intrinsic regime, 
So the Quantanian, uh, Quantanian's work uh, strongly helped us uh, to understand uh, the physics behind. So this uh, result shows uh, uh, spin, this uh, results can be regarded as uh, conductivity dependence of spin hole conductivity. And uh, uh, Sagasta's work uh, is along this region. But uh, in our case, the uh, platinum is highly resistive. So we are located around this region, which means uh, spin hole conductivity uh, uh, rapidly goes down as a function of the uh, conventional, uh, conventional conductivity. In fact, when we replot our experimental results, so the, this contains plot, so our experimental results is nicely uh, reproduced by contains result, we even though we uh, change the thickness of the protein. So the point here is that the, we successfully reached the low conductive region and also intrinsic spin hole region. And uh, of course, uh, there are some calculations uh, about uh, in, uh, intrinsic spin hole conductivity as a function as a position of permeable. This is one example. And as you see, the spin hole conductivity goes down uh, when the Fermi level uh, is goes up, uh, is, uh, Fermi level goes up. So here, uh, the uh, suppression of the uh, Inverse spin hole effect uh, appears only in the uh, appears uh, in the positive gate voltage region. So here, the positive gate application uh, means the upshift of the uh, Fermi level, and uh, in fact, uh, theory predicted uh, such kinds of behavior. So uh, this is the other paper. This is very old paper, but uh, here I emphasize the importance of the uh, D-band density of state. So as you know, so intrinsic spin hole effect is governed by the inter d band scattering. This means the uh, density of state of d orbitals plays a very important role. And uh, here is a Fermi level of the d band uh, electrons. And as you see, above Fermi levels, the density of d bands uh, largely uh, rapidly goes down. And from these uh, theoretical calculations, uh, we can say our results can be explained qualitatively. Uh, by theory. Of course, uh, here I emphasize this is qualitatively, but uh, uh, of course, uh, these calculations are carried out for uh, bulk systems, but uh, my system is a very uh, thin, ultra thin system, uh, low uh, symmetry system. So this is the reason why I should say this is just qualitatively. But anyway, so uh, to, uh, my, our results can be explained to a certain extent, but extent to the uh, ex uh, such kinds of uh, uh, such uh, theoretical calculations. And actually, if our scenario is correct, the modulation should vanish in thicker platinum because the uh, carrier accumulation ratio uh, decreases. And this means the uh, Fermi level shifting, shifting becomes smaller. And the direct and the density of state uh, is less changed because of it. And the intrinsic spin hole conductivity becomes unchanged. And in fact, as I show here, so when we decrease, uh, sorry, when we increase the thickness of platinum, so the defect uh, disappears rapidly. So the, this experiment also strongly supports our claim. So ionic gating uh, is a very potential way to uh, extract a very inter a new interesting physics, such kinds of superconductivity in insulative oxides and so on. And uh, we use this interesting technique ionic gating, and this allows the modulation of resistivity of metallic materials, and modulation of inverse spin hole effect, and modulation of spin hole conductivity uh, by using uh, ultra thin uh, platinum. Okay, this is the final slide. So this, this is very simple. Now we are in the third generation uh, spin current electronics of spin electronics. And uh, in the modern uh, spin current electronics and spin electronics, such kinds of low dimensional low material system is much, much uh, important, is becoming much, much important to pioneer attractive uh, physics uh, and also uh, spin electronics. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, let's send a round of uh, virtual applause by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Sorry? So for questions, um, please use the raise hand options and uh, you can do that by clicking the participants button at the bottom. 
and uh, in the pop-out menu you can click the uh, raise hand it should be at the bottom of that uh, pop-out menu can i ask the the, the first question yeah um so for the uh, ionic gating if i understand it correctly uh there can be both of the electrostatic process and the electrochemical process yeah where there's actually can have a chemical reactions with um let's say oxygen um in your system it's platinum so it's uh it's probably very resistive to to chemical reaction but mm -hmm. have you checked that do you have um any electrochemical process in this uh in this uh uh, ionic gating? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So first, uh, ionic gating sometimes attacks the surface of metallic films. And uh, my ongoing uh, work is uh, <laughs> such kinds of gate tunable uh, spin conversion by using copper and palladium. And uh, but uh, when we use copper, uh, copper is not so uh, it's not a so tough material comparing with platinum. And uh, when we apply the large gate voltages, so the surface of, co of copper is easily oxidized or some chemical reaction takes place. So we should pay much attention to control the uh, uh, magnitude of the gate voltages. But uh, whole, uh, luckily, uh, in case of platinum, because platinum is very tough, so even when we apply the two volt uh, to the system, so the surface not, does not uh, react and uh, in fact, uh, when we, uh, sorry, when we uh, apply the two volt and uh, 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 inverse spin hole uh, effect was missing, uh, then we come back to the uh, zero gate position, but uh, the signal is still alive. So completely uh, result is uh, reproducible. So in this sense, I can say, uh, uh, at least for platinum, uh, the system is stable. Thank you. Have you checked the speed of this ion ionic gating? Ah, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, because uh, in order to stabilize the uh, ions, so we have to wait a couple of minutes. So ah. typically, we wait thirty minutes uh, before starting the measurements. So yeah, and also we slightly decrease the temperature. This is not so important, but uh, uh, to enhance the stabilization, we slightly decrease the temperature. I see. Thank you. Um, do you have other questions in the audience? Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, can I ask another? Um, oh, Kirill, do you have a question? Yes. Um, so with respect to this um, last example you showed with platinum and the spin hole conductivity, maybe I missed that, but do you know how the resistivity changes, um, how the resistivity oh. changes on the gating? Okay, uh, this is not resistivity, but resistance, but uh, probably the same. Um, so this is a gate voltage dependence for res resistivity. Mm -hmm. So at zero, zero gate voltage, the resistance is about uh, 2,000 ohm to kilo ohm. But uh, when I apply the two volt, uh, the resistance goes down about the half of the maximum. So I think uh, this is due to the mainly due to the uh, low carrier system. The, the uh, how to say, uh, as I mentioned, yeah. Uh, our platinum is a low carrier density system, six times 10 to the 21st. So of course this is uh, lower uh, comparing with the conventional metallic systems, but uh, some of you know, as some of you know, uh, platinum is famous uh, for the low carrier density system because uh, um, the Fermi level of platinum consists of uh, two parts. One part from the, it's coming from the uh, S like electrons and uh, D like hole. Uh, the other is the D like holes. And the contribution is 0.6, maybe it's uh, just a moment. I can show the slide. Ah, this one, yeah. Uh, this is better. Maybe this is better. Yeah, uh, 
six is uh, 0.416 is excellence uh, per uh, platinum atom uh, due to the uh, co uh, co uh, contribution of the whole band, uh, D like whole bands. So, and experimentally, so the carrier density, uh, carrier number of platinum is reported to be 0.24 conduction excellence per one atom. And uh, from this fact, uh, our estimation is not so uh, physically unusual, I think. So you think that this uh, downward uh, slope in the resistivity as you go to uh, positive gating comes from the fact that the Fermi level is pushed above the uh, D band in, in platinum, is that? Yeah, so mainly, yes. So we suppress uh, D band contribution by the positive gating. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, uh, reason why, this, this is the physics of the suppression of the uh, spin hole conductivities. Okay, thank you. All right, just to, just to follow up uh, with uh, Kiro's uh, question about the resistance, uh, just naively speaking um, from the symmetry point of view, shouldn't the resistance be symmetric about the gating voltage? Ah, good question. Yeah, uh, here I show only the upward sweep result. So this means uh, the gate voltage starts from minus two volt and uh, this increase and uh, uh, reached at uh, two volts. And when we carry uh, carried out the down, downward sweep, so the, oh, sorry, downward sweep, uh, the, the, the gate voltage dependence of resistance is uh, like this, because uh, this is hysteresis. So of course, the motion of the ions is not so fast. So uh, and, uh, because of this, uh, such kinds of hysteresis takes place. I see. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other question from uh, Zoom or Twitch. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, so if there's uh, no other question, oh, there is one. Uh, Eric Montai, please uh, go ahead with unmute and uh, ask a question. Okay, hi, thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, you. I, you measured the resistivity and you have um, grain boundary scattering and interface scattering will come into yeah. play with that. Um, do you know which one was dominant in your system, and does that matter for the gating? Um, yeah, so in my memory, so this small p is a uh, surface scattering contribution ratio, and xi is a uh, grain boundary scattering ratio. So judging from these values, so grain boundary scattering may be dominant. Have okay. I answered to your question? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering for, so if the, you're, you're changing this interface, whether if the, the scattering of in platinum is happening more within, uh, at the grain boundaries versus the scattering happening at the interface. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, but yeah, that, that answers my question, but I, I just don't, I, I need to think about it. So thank uh -huh. you. Uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, we have uh, one more question. And uh, just, uh, have you tried the effect uh, coming from different type of ionic material? Uh, currently, we have uh, we have been using uh, this type of. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so this type of uh, ionic gels because uh, I'm uh, collaborating with a chemist. And uh, according to him, uh, currently this is the most, uh, uh, how to say, if this allows the uh, most efficient uh, charge accumulations to the system and easy to handle. And uh, that's the reason. But uh, in principle, uh, such kinds of, uh, all of such kinds of ionic gels can be used to the uh, such kinds of uh, experiments. And of course, it depends on the people. Some people use uh, uh, the different materials. so. This is completely up to you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's no other question, I would like to thank the speaker again.